So do you have it all figured out? I mean, do you have it figured out yet? Have you ever run into someone that is just so cocky, so sure of themselves? And they just have it all figured out. That no matter what you're going to say to them, no matter how you're going to say it, no matter what you do with them, they're just going to stick to their guns and say that they're right and you're wrong. That everything that's in their mind is perfect and ready. And so they're just going to just tell you that you're wrong. Because I used to be a little bit like that, I'll tell you. You know, I had that little side to me. My father used to say this thing to me all the time. He says, could you just for a moment take the cotton out of your ears and put it into your mouth? You know, it's just it's like sometimes we can get like that. That, that you know, we, are, we just get those blinders on and, and we're just so sure that, that we, we, you know, we just got to keep pushing and keep pushing. We're at this section of Matthew's Gospel. Where we are right now is actually deep into the Gospel. It's in chapter 17. And all around this particular passage, Jesus is making predictions. He's talking about how he's going to have to take up the cross. Just a few lines before this, Jesus asks them, asks all of his disciples, who do you say that I am? And of course, it was St. Peter who jumped up and said, no, you're the Christ. You're the Son of God. You're the one. So why the transfiguration? I mean, it's chapter 17. Wouldn't it have been better for Jesus maybe to do this early in the gospel? Maybe right away so that they get the point who this person really is that they're dealing with? Why the transfiguration? Now, I, I, I remember there was a professor in the seminary who had this knack for trying to take certain stories like these and water them down you know, make it seem like it really wasn't that big of a deal, that it wasn't something important. And so his thing was, well, you know, Peter, James, and John, they just had one of these aha moments. This didn't really happen. While they were up on the mountain and they were praying, they finally had an insight and understood that Jesus was the Son of God. Now, you know, we seminarians, we never pushed against those things because you didn't want the professor to fail you because you said he was wrong. So the professors were always right. Just remember that whenever you, if any of you go send your kids off to college, the professor's always right. Just yes them to death and just move on. But the professor was wrong. And the more I look at the scriptures, the more I pray over the scriptures, and the more I look at a passage like this, it says to me that they, the disciples, and we, today's disciples, need to be reassured that we don't have it all figured out. We don't have it all figured out. You know, there was a period of church history not too long ago where, you know, like the 50s and 60s, the church leadership said, ah, we've got this. Don't worry about it. We can cruise because, you know, everybody's going to church. Everybody's doing their thing. We have, you know, we have this authority, if you will. We have this power and we can just make a proclamation and everybody will fall in line. But that kind of obstinacy is not good. Jesus' own disciples still aren't quite getting it. And Jesus is singling out Peter, James, and John right now because he needs to start molding them and getting them ready for the cross. See, they still have it in their mind that he's going to be some sort of a Davidic warrior, that he's going to rush in and kick the Romans out and sit on a throne, literally sit on a throne and rule from that throne in Jerusalem. And they're just so fixed on that, that they're still not getting it. Even the St. Peter that just a few lines before could proclaim Jesus as the Christ. The same James and John that a few lines later are going to want to ask Jesus and make sure one of us sits on your right and one sits on your left. They know something is different about Jesus, but they still don't quite understand because of the blinders that they're wearing. But Jesus really is the one, but he's not going to be the one of their expectations. And how many of us, week after week, come to church with certain expectations? How many of us get a bit of a self-righteous attitude because, well, you know, I, I did my time. I put my hour in. 
I'm going to get, you know, more privileges at the pearly gates when I get there. Yeah, try that with St. Peter. I've, I've said this in my own journey, and I say this to you in all honesty. If you think you've got it figured out, you're in trouble. Because the devil likes us to not be really paying attention to the truth. And the truth of it is, no one of us are going to have it completely figured out on this side of the grave. It's just not going to happen. Jesus really is the one. So what do we have to do? We have to actually open ourselves up. We actually have to become pliable. Rigidity just won't work because if we think we have it all figured out, well, we're just going to become fixed on something. Now, I'm sure some of you who are sitting here right now have been married for a while. Some, you know, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. I've met couples up to 70 years married. And I've asked couples, especially the longer that they're married, I've asked couples, is it what you thought it would be? And they all say the same thing. No, not really. You know, you know when a couple walks down this aisle after getting married, they're filled with all these ideals. They have it all figured out. We're in love. Everything is going to be perfect. We're never going to have any problems. We're never going to disagree. We're never... And they find out like a couple of days later, that's not true. That life is real and that it takes effort and relationships where we have to invest in them. If we don't invest in relationships, relationships fall apart, don't they? Parents, you know this with your children. Husbands and wives, you know this with each other. Children with your parents, even with your acquaintances and friends. If you don't invest at some point in the relationship, it begins to falter. It begins to fall apart. And the same, my dear brothers and sisters, is true with Jesus Christ. For each and every one of us here today, if we think that we're superior because we're sitting here today, or if we think we've got it all figured out because, you know, I did my part, I, I said my prayers the other day, I'm good, then we're missing the point because a relationship with Jesus Christ demands that I be a little bit more pliable and open maybe to even some of the surprises he has in store for us. Isn't that what Lent is supposed to be about? There are miracles. The transfiguration is a miraculous event that Jesus did in his relationship with Peter, James, and John. The Peter, James, and John who will, in a short while, be scandalized by the crucifixion. The same Peter, James, and John who, even up until the crucifixion, need that reassurance, need that openness because they're going to be disheartened. They're going to be downtrodden. But Jesus really is the one. And if we can start from there, then we can start to say to ourselves as well, I need to grow. I need to keep nourishing my relationship. I need to see miracles. You know, faith is not a static concept. Just because I say I believe in Jesus, it's not static. It's got to be vibrant. If I believe in Jesus Christ, there has to be a vibrancy in my life. There has to be a dynamism in my life that really, really wells up all the time. We, we say it again and again. What's at the heart of our faith? Well, Jesus Christ. But if we just say those words and don't say, and I need to encourage others to come to Jesus Christ. I need myself to again and again come to Jesus Christ. Faith is not something that's static. And if your faith seems dry and static, that's why we give you Lent every year. Jesus really is the one. And so how is your Lenten journey going? It, you know, it always, it always starts off really great. On Ash Wednesday, we're all geared up. We get our ashes. We've made our promises. We're going to pray more. We're going to fast more. And like by the first Sunday of Lent, we're starting to like already falter a little bit. Renew that fast. Renew your prayer. So here's the challenge for all of you. Lent is a time of embellishing our relationship with Jesus Christ and opening ourselves up to new possibilities of healing the things within us 
that hold us back. The one thing I discovered, I mean, last week, Jesus was tempted by the devil. The one thing that I've discovered in my own journey is there's something that the devil always wants to see happen. It's got two parts to it. Number one, he wants us to not pay attention to Jesus. I think you figured that part out already. <laughs> it's pretty obvious. He doesn't want us to pay attention to Jesus. So he throws things into our lives. He throws wounds. He throws in pains. He throws in problems. He throws in all sorts of stuff, money, power, glory. He just keeps throwing and keeps throwing it at us so that we're not paying attention to Jesus. And the other thing he loves tremendously is for us to feel confused. Do you ever feel confused in your relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you ever feel like you're, you're left wondering, maybe this is all just a big lie, maybe? Why, why am I going through these motions? Why do I do this? He loves to get you into that mode. And I love to pull you out of that mode. And so I'm encouraging you right now. Jesus really is the one. Push harder, go further. Ask for the healing that you need of whatever it is that the devil has thrown at you in your life. Whether it's something that dates back to your childhood, whether it is a problem that you've recently encountered, whatever it is, bring it to him and ask for healing. That's why we here at St. Joseph's decided that our Lenten theme will be this healing. And on Monday nights, we're praying in here for healing. And we have specific things each week that we're going to ask the Lord to heal within us. So many of us feel hopeless or powerless. I, I mean, we, we lose that zeal. We lose that, that feeling. Maybe it's because of the death of a loved one. Maybe it's because of a wound or a hurt. And we start to feel like there's just nothing that I can strive for any longer. Pray for healing. Pray that the Lord heals that. We're going to later on in Lent offer to you the 99 experience because that's an opportunity for you to come outside of this gathering and to work with others, talk with others, spend time with others who are going through similar things that you're going through. So seriously consider coming tomorrow night for healing and then joining eventually the 99 experience later in Lent. As a parish, as a people, as those called to a new life in Christ, I encourage all of you, don't get caught in the rut and the routine. Don't allow yourself to, to sit there and think, oh, don't worry, I'm okay. Everything is fine. Put up the front. I got it. I got it all figured out. Or maybe I don't. For the next couple of weeks, this Jesus is really the one, is going to hammer home. The encounter of the woman at the well with Jesus Christ that we're going to hear next week. What a powerful, powerful um, encounter. An encounter I encourage all of you to have. The man born blind who is suddenly healed, whose vision is restored. And then the most impressive one of all, Lazarus, come out. I get goosebumps just thinking about it. So my dear brothers and sisters, allow Jesus who works miracles to start working miracles in your life. Let him heal whatever holds you back. Let him open whatever is closed. Let him pour his grace into you so that as a vessel of grace, you will thrive rather than stagnate. You will be vibrant rather than dull. For Jesus Christ really is the one. And as the one, he will come to you. He will embrace you. He will show his love to you and one day, God willing, lead you to his home where he is Lord forever and ever. But between now and then, like any other relationship we have, we have to put time and effort into it. We have to go further. We have to do more. So get back on your Lenten journey if you've fallen off already. Once again, recommit to the penances that you are going to do, the prayers you are going to offer, the alms you are going to give. Get back on it right now and don't let it falter because time is so precious for us with Jesus Christ. And with Jesus Christ, miracles do happen. Be the miracle. God bless you.